Hey everybody, welcome back to Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Diana Chen, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, Sarah Mayohas. She is an OG NFT artist, and more recently a VC at Spark Capital. And many of you who have been in the space for a while might remember her as the creator of Bitcoin from back in, I believe it was 2015, super early days. And we'll talk all about that with her and about all of the other projects that she's worked on as well. Um, I'm I'm particularly interested in this one project she had called Stock Performance, which really combines these two concepts that people normally don't tie together at all, finance and art. I'm really excited to hear her explain to everybody, you know, sort of how she sees these two um, kind of like polar opposite things being actually like quite related. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. (laughs) Um, So before we dive into all of your awesome projects, can you give listeners a little background into like where you came from before the crypto world and then how you initially fell down the crypto rabbit hole? Yeah, so I think my education kind of sums it up in a nutshell, right? I, I studied finance at Wharton and then I immediately went to Yale and got an MFA in fine arts. So you know, it's kind of the two sides of the brain. Um, I can't, I can't decide, so I just combine them. Uh, before that, actually, my main interest was fashion, which also has a lot to, you know, which has a lot to do with like image and representation and uh, of like women and right. Almost feeds in a little bit to kind of some of the projects, you know, with you know, Bitcoin is the primary example. Uh, yeah, that's that's more or less the background. Gotcha. And then how did you start learning about crypto in the first place? Was it um, while you were studying finance at Wharton or how did you come across it? It was while I was studying art. (laughs) Because no one in finance was looking at Bitcoin at the time. Right. And uh, with art, you know, I was I've always considered myself a conceptual artist. And. I was at the time very interested in the concept of value and how value uh, is related to representation, right? And thinking about, especially, you know, I was in a photography program and photography has, has has an interesting place in the world because it's both in, like, in all sorts of different fields, right? It's from, like, you know, advertising to medical imaging, right? falls into to snapshots right falls into the fold of photography so the notion of photography as fine art right and as having a value that's distinctive right and and like a higher kind of aesthetic value is one that i was kind of thinking about like really acutely so uh i was thinking about value and and also the other thing about art and especially trying to be a conceptual artist is that you really want to be at the like the edge right the avant-garde right the art in the 20th century was really about breaking down boundaries right of separate like you know art had its had its field and then suddenly it was about saying no art can also be sound art can be happenings art can be words art can be anything you want it to be uh and so part of it was breaking boundaries. And then now it's no longer about breaking boundaries. It's like, what is actually good art, right? Because anything can be art if you say it is. But the art has a relationship with the avant-garde. And right now it doesn't always have that relationship anymore because we are um, in like the throes of sort of social upheavals. That means that like, you know, identity politics kind of becomes like a really weighty subject matter, which is not necessarily as related to the avant-garde. But for me, the avant-garde is important. And so when I heard about Bitcoin and its development, it was like, okay, this is, this is the avant-garde. This is like what's next, right? And this is so beyond, right, (laughs) what our current systems are and so visionary uh, that, that that's why I started looking into it. So like in 2014, that makes a lot of sense hearing you explain it. At first, I was like, you found out about crypto through art. How is that possible? But I'm I'm starting to see the connection there. Um, so real quick, I want to talk about Bitcoin. I I know you've talked about it on other podcasts, and you know people can find information about it online. 
But I'm interested in it because when the first time I heard about Bitcoin, it was actually Damien Hirst's project and not yours. And it wasn't until quite a while later that I realized that your Bitcoin project existed years before uh, Damien Hirst's project. Um, so maybe for listeners who aren't familiar, can you just give the quick TLDR about what your Bitcoin project is? And then I would love to hear you talk about some of maybe the similarities or differences between your project and Damien Hirst and just how you feel about um, like the two projects and how it's developed and anything you'd like to share there. Yeah. So at the time I was in grad school, right, and um, I was approached by uh, a curator, right, or yeah, curator, she was a PhD student in art history, and she, she and so Lucy and Raphael were running an experimental art space out of a shipping container in Brooklyn, and they approached me because they wanted to make an exhibition that was a prediction, and, uh, and, and so I feel like that, you know, I haven't really sort of, it kind of came back to me recently about how that's like a really interesting prompt, both for like a show and in retrospect, what happened. Uh, so it was a prediction. And so it was a prediction, both like based on kind of me as an artist, and then also like, how can we format something that can like appreciate as a, like, you know, as a, you know, as a bet. So that was the that was the impetus for for starting to think about creating Bitcoin, and I um, I was very into the idea of turning this shipping container unit that you could only see through a webcam into a mine, right? Uh, and at the time, like Dogecoin had come out, and there was like some news about that, and so Bitch is kind of funny because it's both the sort of like aggressive feminine you know hyper feminine you know but it's also like a female dog right <laughs> so <laughs> i like came up with that name and it was just like this is too perfect i must i must make my own meme coin and mine it in brooklyn <laughs> and then i thought of you know i'm just walking through you through the steps i i thought well like why would anybody want my bitch coins uh, and, uh, and so that's when I decided to back it at a fixed rate by my photography. You know, I was in a photography program, 25 square inches per coin forever. And then in terms of conceiving of the photographs, that's where things also got interesting because, you know, I like to do things that are really funny, right? And we'll get to, we'll, you know, there's always humor in my work, but there's always like a really serious, like almost like metaphysical, um, component. And I was really fascinated. So on the one hand, there's the humor, but on the other hand, I was at the time very fascinated about how Bitcoin was borrowing so much language that was very physical um, and related to gold, right? That now we, you know, accept it. But at the time it was kind of like odd, right? You know, so, and art and gold have a relationship. Like, Art in a, in, is, in a sense, like a form of alchemy, right? You're turning base materials into something of a much higher order, right? That's the goal. Uh, and so I love that Bitcoin had this, like, metaphor to gold. And so I created these, um, these so I liked, I liked that. And so I created these photographs that I called speculations that were you know, a play on words, obviously, on financial speculation, but also on, like, specular relations, specular as as related to mirrors. And there was all of this reading about kind of alchemy and reflection and brilliance. And in the case of the photographs, they create these, you know, visually, they create these blocks that extend kind of infinitely like a like a chain, like a blockchain, but it's also um, like a constant. It's a constant, like it's a constant, like transaction or exchange that's happening, right? Because it's like a three dimensional object appraises itself as two dimension, but then that it's itself an image that kind of gets reflected again and on and on. So the light is just caught bouncing back and forth between the two, and it's also meta. It's like an illusion of an expansion of space, kind of like mining is an illusion. Anyways, 
none of this is supposed to be like totally logical, right? It's supposed to be just kind of inspiration. But that was Bitcoin at the time. And it was a fork of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it happened. And at the time it got, a, you know, some press like wired. And then it was all on all sorts of blogs. And like people, you know, definitely remember it. And it was clearly, I realized it was clearly an idea that had like stickiness to it. And then when I thought about extending the idea, like, I was like, oh, God, like, this is like, the landscape at the time was not conducive for someone who wasn't themselves, like, a you know, cryptographer, like, <laughs> like an intensely technical person to engage with, you know, with this stuff in a way that, yeah was like <laughs> would lead to something yeah how I, I'm curious too like how you navigated that because um like this was in 2015 right yeah so I worked on it in 2014 and then formally the opening was in February of 2014 right so the this on chat rooms and <laughs> like talk to kind of anonymous people who then would spend time with me on Skype to like teach me how things worked. Um, and the crazy thing is like, I can't get in touch with, there were like two people who helped me do it. And I never, they never revealed their identity to me. And I like tried to, and I like, like I paid them in Bitcoin to help me kind of set it up. And I've tried to get in touch with them and I, I can't, like, I don't know how, you know? Yeah. What a wild world. How did you get your friends and family to understand what you were doing or what was their reaction to what you were doing? Um, you know, I sold them certificates, right, that had a, like a public key on the front and a private key on the back. And I had these gold lips, like embossed, and I even put like lipstick on my own lips and kissed it and that was what they got and they were you know they were they were not crypto people not not a lot of them some were you know um but but it was more the um the novelty of also an artist being so upfront about the financial speculation that comes to an artist's work right you know as an artist even in the traditional world you have to think about like the volume right of what you're putting out in the world and how it's being distributed and I was just expressing that in more clear terms uh and so it was almost more at the time for for part of the audience it was more of yeah, the relational aesthetics of locating art in the exchange, right, and and um, and making that clear, making clear like the dynamics of that uh, as a commentary on the financialization of art. And funny, funnily enough, Damien Hirst, right, Warhol is like was the primary example of this, right? His work, there's always some sort of Warhol on auction somewhere, but Damien Hirst is also was a great example of that. Um, you know, his dots are, are a currency. <laughs> uh, so funny. Yeah. So it was more, it, it was seen almost in some ways as a, as a comment on that in addition to, yeah, the, the kind of blockchain part, which, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so talk more about Damien Hirst's Bitcoin project that came out years later. What was sort of like the inspiration behind that and how did it make you like were you flattered that somebody you know like rebirthed your project from years ago or were you like upset that he was getting credit for something that you had sort of coined um in the past or like what were your thoughts on that you know Damien Hurst is like a, a formidable businessman he's he's like I mean it's amazing um, I don't think that he has, I don't want to say bad things about him because actually he was an inspiration to me in, in certain ways. Um, 
but I think that he's really transformed into business of art, right? Um, so when he did his project, you know, and he's he's always borrowed ideas of other artists very openly, and he just he um, he he overproduces everything, right? Like he so he has more um, more marketing power, right? It was just kind of the thing that was annoying about it um, was frankly that like I feel like my project is obviously more authentic, but also just like better than his like this project. Like I'm not saying like my entire of is better than Damien Hirst, but in this particular instance. I am strongly of the opinion that I have a, a better project, but that he is has ex exceptional marketing and good branding. And the thing that just got me was like the 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 kind of financial success that he uh, was getting out of this, uh, and it just felt a little bit like, ugh, like can I just like can Bitcoin flip? the currency, you know, <laughs> like, that would be the goal, <laughs> you know, uh, um, and, um, yeah, and so, and, and the reporters at Artnet, where I wrote one of the pieces, immediately contacted me when his project came out to write an op-ed, right, I am not normally a writer, but they immediately contacted me because they know about, they knew about Bitcoin at the time, they knew about it and they like, you know, they smelled it immediately, right? So I wasn't the one knocking on Artnet's door asking to to write a piece um, showing how, you know, it was a you know, very, very similar. So, yeah, so it was just like, oh, come on. Like, and I just wish like people could see, you know, people like could rally a bit uh, around Bitcoin. But um, but uh, I clearly need to get better at uh, marketing. <laughs> We should team up. Maybe I can help you with that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I'm curious too, because like one thing I found ironic is that one of your inspirations for creating Bitcoin was that you wanted to create this like hyper feminine thing. Uh, whereas, you know, I, I obviously like I don't think um, that was like part of the goal for Damien when he created his project. So I'm curious to here, you know, other than sure, like he's good at marketing, but probably there are probably like other factors involved too. Like maybe the space had developed to a certain point or like the culture in the space was different by the time that he came around. Do you think any of those factors played in or, um, or if not, like, I'd, I'd also love to just hear your thoughts on how you feel like the culture has shifted from 2015 to 2018 to today. I honestly just think it's 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 marketing. Like um his project his project is like literally a kind of mashup of trends that he saw in the space, right? It's it's probably somewhat derived from Bitcoin, but it's also right like inspired by, you know, crypto punks and the rarities. Um, and he's just done it in a way that's like, has no conceptual grounding, right? He, that, that's kind of it. It's almost uninteresting to talk about because he doesn't actually have a point of view, right? Like the point of view with Bitcoin is like, you're owning a piece of me and also it's physically backed, right? But not in a way that like gets destroyed after a year, right? The destruction after a year is just to make his life easier. Right, because constantly holding on and storing something, you know, for the foreseeable future, uh, for as long as these NFTs are alive, is 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 kind of you know annoying, but is more in line with the notion of something being backed by, you know, in this case, like a proof of work, which is cloud of petals. So, it's it's almost uninteresting to talk about because he doesn't have a point of view. Um, it's it's just a mashup. Um, yeah, but, um, and Bitcoin is like, in a sense, it's explicitly feminine, but at the same time, I'm not, um, I don't want to be like dogmatic about that. Crypto should be moving past 
these dichotomies of gender. And so, you know, there are a lot of like women led projects right now. And I find that some, sometimes it's almost like, oh, look at this like woman at work. And like, it's like almost like we're like regressing, you know, um, where we should be like post this, uh, and and I I understand where it's coming from because yes there is still like a total underrepresentation of women in the crypto space but hopefully you can like absorb um sort of empowering women while also transcending a sharp dichotomy of like for women for men uh, so Bitcoin is also for men yeah i love that i'm totally with you like it's it really is disheartening to see and feel like the regression that it seems like we've made in the crypto space um but like within crypto itself it does feel like we're you know 10 years in the past or even 20 years in the past with how far we've come with gender equality and so i think you know i think that's why like it needs to be called out more like in an ideal world we and like in the outside world, you know, it's probably not less necessary to like specifically say this is a women led project. Let's support women in the space. Um, but I think for now, like we're just so behind the time still in crypto that it, it is needed, in, in my opinion. Um but yeah, I want to talk to you about stock performance, which is a really interesting project, I think, for several reasons. First of all, because most people don't tie finance and art with each other. You know, people see finance as this like super like rational, cold, um, emotionless thing, whereas they see art as a lot more emotional, a lot more creative, a lot more like having this human component to it. Uh, so Tell people about stock performance and, you know, like how you see, you've already talked about this a little bit in the intro, like how you kind of see the ties between finance and art, but specifically as it relates to stock performance, um, what inspired you to like do something that is so inherently like contradictory in some people's minds? Yeah. So stock performance for, for those who don't know, I uh, did a performance um, where I manipulated stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. And I did it, you know, once, you know, I do it one a day. I don't, you know, maybe I'll revisit it. But, <laughs> uh, and then I would go up to a, this was, I was, you know, again, performing this kind of work out of, out of a gallery, right, seated in the middle of a gallery space. The show started with all these white canvases around, like the ultimate art joke, right? That you have a, like a white painting. And then I would go up to a canvas and very gesturally, like, um, you know, redraw the line that I had manipulated on the canvas, right? And, um, and so I would pick stocks that had very thin uh, like order books, right. That had very little activity, but that were not penny stocks. Like people are like, Oh, like what kind of stocks? Like, you know, people try hard to not manipulate, to not move stocks when they're buying them. So if you do want to move them, it's actually fairly easy. And I could even, you know, I even manipulated a 8 billion market cap stock by like 13%, right? Like that's, <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's possible to do that. Uh, you just have to place some aggressive orders and not that aggressive. I don't want to reveal how aggressive, but shockingly little. Uh, and so with that piece, you know, there is, um, there's a question of like the record, right? There's like the financial record. There's a painting as a record. A painting is inherently a record. Uh, there's a question of, and, and so one of the, and, and in a sense, Stock performance ended up also being somewhat ahead of its time with the GameStop, you know, saga, right? And I'm like coming into a system with, an, with another logic, with another purpose, other than simply like making money, right? Uh, 
the um, the thing that's amazing about the stock market is that it's this insane aggregator of information. Perhaps the most insane aggregator of information, like on the planet. I don't know, you know, and it gets distilled right to to like a line, right, which is the basis of all sort of visual representation, a point and a line. And that that exchange, that that line is like the exchange at the moment between two people, right? Like all of this activity around the world, right, gets condensed to that is is both totally amazing, but also creates it its own, like as a result of that, creates its own reality. And as we know, the market itself, right, can dictate what's happening to a company, which like has been happening before, but GameStop is like a perfect example of this. I think now the company is, you know, well on its way <laughs> to, <laughs> to doing better. So, so the market is very self-reflexive. Uh, this line is self-reflexive. Painting is also self-reflexive, especially in modern art. So I was drawing, you know, I, I'm like tying knots together here between drawing and trading uh, and, um, and between and, and the gesture in different regards, right? The gesture on the market, basically saying like, I was here at this point in time, hello, you know, I'm marking myself here and I'm marking myself right on, on the canvas. So that's where stock performance, uh, you know, really started. Also very funny. <laughs> and, um, and, and yeah, and, and, you know, you know, the truth and, and some, you know, people on the finance side saw it like also as, you know, art is like a manipulated market, which it is because, you know, it's everything is, you know, illiquid and different. Um, there's a lot of manipulation in crypto, right? In all sorts of ways, tokenomics, ponzonomics, like, uh, and, and in line with the stock performance piece, I did this thing called the non-existent token, which is this smart contract where you place a bid and you get this NFT of a bubble and then the next person can only bid 10% more, at which point the previous person gets all their money back plus 5% and the NFT switches and turns into a receipt that advertises your return. And so at any given time, only one person has, right? The NFT of the bubble. So it's kind of like an NFT that can never go down because, um, and it, you know, the 5% is like my royalty, right? This is, so it's almost mimicking some of the, uh, the insane speculation in the NFT world uh, and also being another, it's in line with stock performance, you know, of like, you know, a, a piece that is its own financial manipulation uh, and, and kind of questions like, what is existence on the blockchain, right? Is it, is it being token? What about control? What about ownership? Is this ownership? No, it's not, right? Uh, you can't actually, yeah, control it. So, yeah, stop. That kind of, the non-existent token kind of reminds me of uh, Mitchell Chan's IKB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Mitchell and I have become good friends. We have, we have much in common, including a love for Eve Klein, which has, who has, a, who has been a real inspiration for me. Again, this, this Eve Klein was the original figure of the, the metaphysical jokester, right? Uh, he makes, yeah. Um, I feel like he, he's like the king of conceptual art. Yeah, yeah, Eve Klein. I have a question about, so you talked a lot about sort of like, the financialization of art and how art actually has a lot of similarities to like the stock market, like in the sense that both can be so easily manipulated. How do you like, how would you like people to, I guess, approach um, art in the NFT space or see art? Is there like a right way to do it? Because like right now, I think people take such different views on NFT art. Some people are like really in it for the art. Um, some people are like really in it for the community. Other people are just in it for trading. You know, like they treat NFT art the same way that they treat Bitcoin. Um, 
from your view, like, is there a certain way that you wish people would view NFT art? It's that's a great question because I think that like NFT art has we are at you know we're still at the inception of like what's possible right we're still so limited by the format of like these small JPEGs and these small videos so I think that there's a lot of room to grow I think that it, you know it's it's interesting because in the traditional fine art world right some of the biggest art collectors are people who work in finance or who worked in finance, right? Um, so there's both an appreciation of of the art and, and ultimately, right, as a collector, like you really do have to love what you're buying because it's very hard to treat art as an investment. Like in the in the traditional art world, right, if you looked at the auction catalogs, of like really contemporary art so not you know not you know Matisse and whatever but very contemporary art 10 years apart the names are not the same right there is a there's a huge turnover um between between like what's valued um in in a decade uh so it's a highly highly speculative investment but the fact that they're objects that do have like value attached to them means that people who work in high finance both have can have like the appreciation of the art as such and also be able to feel comfortable with spending money on art. Interestingly, so far, you know, the te- the traditional tech community did not engage in art. Right? To the chagrin of museums trying to raise money, it has been impossible to convince, right, Mark Zuckerberg, etc to donate significant amounts of money to museums. Even though they donate to other causes, art just completely fell by the wayside, whereas people in high finance have supported. And it's so interesting now that blockchain and crypto, which is this merge of technology and finance, does have this like interest in the arts and like creativity, right? So these things, so I don't think it's possible to really be like building a collection that does have, you know, a higher financial value without thinking of it as an investment. And these two become mixed, like whether you want it or not. Uh, And, you know, yes, like to some degree, it it is becoming a bit extreme um, and, and pure speculation, right? Because, because an artwork, doesn't have dividends. I mean, at this point, maybe with royalties, they do, but normally an artwork doesn't have dividends. So it is, it is by definition, the most speculative of investments. Um, I, so I don't mind that there's speculation involved, especially in the context that the artists are not losing out on it with the royalties, right? With no royalties, it would be pure horror. You know, <laughs> uh, and in the traditional art world, in in history, like Robert Rauschenberg, Rauschenberg, right, one of the most important American artists of the 20th century, was lobbying Congress to enact royalties, and he failed because property rights in America are really, really strong. Like. All other creative fields had royalties except for like painters. Um, And there were other artists who also tried to get their collectors to sign resale agreements where they would get part of the resale. Galleries never kind of allowed it to happen because it was such a complication to enforce it. It would make sales more difficult, etc. But artists did try to make this happen. uh, And... And, and failed. Like there are better resale royalty rights, like in Europe, I think, but even there, they're not so great. Um, but this was something that artists wanted when their work started becoming subject to speculation. Wow. I didn't realize it like went that far back. A little piece of, of art history. Yeah, I love it. Um, so it, it sounds like there definitely are parallels between art and finance. And, you know, a lot of people in the high finance world, like you said, have already recognized that. But we're still seeing, I guess, like 
kind of a big divide in um, on crypto Twitter, at least between like the NFT community and the DeFi community. How would you characterize that divide? Um, I think the NFT community is uh, a lot more focused on community and being open and sort of, you know, mainstream adoption of Web3 and crypto, whereas I think the DeFi community is maybe a little more closed off, a little more financially motivated instead of community motivated, um, and maybe like isn't as interested in adopting the mainstream and is a little more uh, turned off to like beginners who are just entering into the space and I think quote unquote diluting their culture, however they perceive that. That's sort of just the way that I like my observation of that divide. Um, how have you have you I'm have you seen sort of like a divide or how would you characterize it? I don't have too much to say on a divide because, you know, I'm I'm obviously more in the NFT community. I mean, I have friends who are like really in DeFi and they are like NFT, you know, they have bought Bitcoins and they're yeah. like supporters. So I'm not sure I ha totally feel the divide, but yes, DeFi is much more, yeah, financially. Uh, they're, yeah, they're different things. It, I feel like they're just too different. The, I will speak though to the, the NFT community aspect is quite interesting because, you know, I'm both like very early, right, with Bitcoin, but then also I'm like, slow and methodical uh and so you know now like i have like a roadmap that i'm working on for bitcoin right and like okay we should have our own standalone site instead of it just being like a page on my artist site and like you know i'm doing still you know i have a movie coming up and how can i you know how can i involve you know bitcoin holders and like you know, I'm going to be developing an extra project. And, you know, so I do have like now a roadmap and I am cognizant of like the need to like really engage your community. But as an artist, you never really had to do this. It's a totally different muscle. Um, and so as someone who like straddles both worlds, sometimes the community aspect of NFTs feels like, like not it doesn't feel silly, but it feels like the NFTs just become your, the NFTs are no longer art and are just like your kind of membership pass mm -hmm. to the community. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not a, you know, now I have to get a co freaking community manager, but like I am not myself a community manager. And so some of the art that's like, or some of the projects that have done well, our, our social clubs first and art very second. Um, so that's an interesting transition where now I have to sort of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on my road and even the, even the word roadmap, right? <laughs> no artist has ever been asked what their roadmap is. <laughs> I now have my roadmap set out for me because I'm interested in, I'm interested in Bitcoin, like, being, you know, given its history, given the complexity of the project, I feel like it still ha it has so much room to grow uh, and to really, I don't know if the word is compete, but to, like, hold its ground, right, um, with sort of other projects that are more professionalized. Um, yeah, so... But yeah, the community thing has been interesting, especially think about artists before, like they're the view of the artist that comes from like Baudelaire, right? He he really created the the view of the 20th century artist. Like the recluse, right? Is outside of the world, is separate from the world, looking into it. And now it's like the opposite. It's like, <laughs> you know, social social maven. Um, so it's uh so that's an interesting transition too. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, it's really interesting hearing your perspective on this because I, I, I think I have a lot more people um, on the podcast who've maybe get, gotten into the space in the last few years and not so far back. Um, 
And it's sort of like, for me, I mean, speaking from my experience, community has been a big thing ever since I joined the space and was like one of the things that pulled me in because I, I, you know, like wasn't, it was never a goal of mine to like make friends by joining crypto, but that sort of just happened. And I was like, wow, this is actually like, I like the people here, you know, like they're people I want to hang out with and be friends with. So I might as well stay. (laughs) Yeah. And I will say that me too. And like the cool thing about crypto is like, you are not, um, I don't know, maybe I'm like naive, but in the real world with, you know, you have physical like proximity and social networks that are like, you know, there's a different, if someone's point is, anyways, sorry, the point I'm making is like in crypto, if you're rude or mean, like, then people don't have to engage with you. Like you have to kind of be respectful of people. Otherwise, it's very easy to, you know, in the normal world, like you have friend groups and you can't like totally be rude to someone if they're friends and you're friend in crypto where people are like kind there's like the pseudo anonymous right quality, like the rules of engagement are a little bit different. And so far I feel like there's been it's like I mean, maybe I'm naive, but so far it's been like pretty good behavior. Like like and pretty cool people who like wanna be there. Sarah, you have not been on Twitter this last week, I can tell. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I haven't. I've been working a lot. I am now a venture partner and many meetings. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. You should keep keep that role going. <laughs> um, I'm interested to hear, uh, as we're coming up on, um, we have to wrap up soon. What are you most excited to see develop in this space in, you know, 2022, as we're just getting started here? Well, I'm a little bit nervous about all of the brands that are going to come into the space, right? There's going to be all sorts of fashion, which I love fashion, but, you know, big brands and fashion is, those are not the same thing, right? So I'm a little bit nervous about NFTs going corporate. Um, so that, cause yeah, so that I'm a little bit nervous about, um, Cause right now it's like fun. It's like cool people like doing cool things, like experimenting, like, you know, uh, so, so that I'm, that I'm eh, queasy about. And I hope that, um, you know, things are done well or whatever, but, um, and then what I'm excited about is, um, yeah, is for NFTs to like continue to innovate. Right. I think that like, Art blocks was like a really interesting innovation of the model, right? Um, but I think that that's just one, one like thing. You know, we we can't stop there. Like, there should be um, more developments. And and my mo obviously always and obviously is is as many links to the real world as possible, right? Is is the way to go because I don't want to give up on the real world, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, and so I keep saying this and so maybe I have to do it myself because I'm like, can we, like, I want to see some like super cool land art and it is an NFT, right? That's like, like maybe I have to just do it because, um, I keep saying it, but, um, you know, or, or like graffiti art and it's an NFT, right? Because that, that's. That's the cool thing is for NFTs to unlock value for things that don't, that could not capture their value before, right? That are otherwise free information, which is land art, graffiti art, like public art, but linking to a physical place is my, my hope for NFTs. Yeah, that's really cool. I think you should definitely do it. We're doing something similar. Have you heard of InkDAO? No, I have. It's like a tattoo DAO. Uh, you need an ERC seven twenty one tattoo on your body to join, and anybody can, as long, anybody who gets that tattoo can join. But we've talked about doing things like, um, like translating these like physical tattoos into NFTs, or helping tattoo artists by getting them onboarded onto NFTs and making this like NFT art that people can then buy and either you know you can keep it and sell it like you would a normal NFT, or you could. Um, 
you could bring it into the tattoo artist and get it actually tattooed on your body and that would burn the, the NFT, but then you would have it on your body sort of thing. So Amazing. yeah, <laughs> amazing. Um, cool. Well, I look forward to whatever you create in the upcoming year and years into the future. I, I like to end every podcast episode with a quick little game. Um, and this season it's called this or that. So it's really easy. I say two words and you pick one, you tell me which one you prefer. There's no explanation needed. We'll just do like rapid fire, blow through these. And, um, some of these are related to crypto. Some are not. Um, but yeah, you ready? Yeah. Okay, cool. So first one, crypto or web three? Crypto. Bitcoin or Ethereum? <sighs> Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> I'll, I'll accept it. Uh, Discord or Telegram? Telegram. Bear market? Discord. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Discord. <laughs> Don't overthink it. <laughs> um, next one, bear market or bull market? Bear market. ERC-721 or ERC-1155? Oof. ERC... <laughs> 721. Okay. NFTs or DeFi? NFTs. Books or podcasts? Books. Morning or night? Morning. Building or investing? God. Building. Okay. Last one. Decentraland or crypto voxels? Decentraland. Okay. Congrats. That's it. You did great. A plus. <laughs> Um, well, Sarah, before you go, tell people where they can find you if they'd like to connect with you personally, um, or like where they can go to learn more about all the projects that we talked about and some projects that we didn't get a chance to touch on today. Yes, find me on Twitter, Sarah May Ojas. There's the Discord link. People should absolutely buy a Bitcoin um, because I have many things planned for it. And yeah, I'm on Instagram as well. I'm on all the, you know, I'm easily searchable. Awesome. Thanks again so much, Sarah. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And we'll be back again soon with another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole.